It was arguments, money troubles, no food, both drinking. Life was really hard. I'd had several miscarriages and life was really rough. But then I got saved and my life was untouchable for about a month. And then I found out I had cancer. And the first thing I done was picked up a bottle and I put it on the table and I intended to drink it. But I knew at that moment that I wasn't going to drink it because all my trust was in God and he brought me through. You know, walking into hospital, I'm terrified, even the smell. But there's people in Valindra that can testify. They call, call my name and I'd be skipping down there. And when you have cancer, especially bowel cancer, you, you lose any self-respect. But I'd done it. And the last one, they all cheered because I didn't think I'd make the 25 because it was days I walked in where I'd be sick, terribly sick. But God sorted it. And the first thing he cured me of was travel sickness. And I didn't know why. I thought that I was going to go travel in the world. But he knew I had to travel back and forth to Cardiff every day to the hospital. So he prepared the way. There's no words to describe my feeling to him. Because I just love him and thank him. And I just want everybody to have more the more I go to, to share in the, the wonderfulness of him. If I could go out downtown and sing, I would. Because he's, he's that good. He's too good for words. Well, it's like having a Christian home. Well, if Peter's naughty, I'm looking at him and he's saying, you're praying for me, I know, which is brilliant. Um, it's fabulous because we've gone through our strives, but there's a respect there now that was never there before. Plus, you try to be extra nice because you know God is watching you, so. <laughs> you just hope your heart is saying the same as what's coming out of your mouth. You know, that was a, a lovely, lovely testimony. You know, this morning there's such a wonderful atmosphere of God's love and God's grace and God, God's pouring out his healing and anointing oil amongst us this morning. And, you know, it's great that we can be honest. We can be honest with one another. That was such an honest testimony from Kath. And, you know, we, we, need to, we need to take off those masks. You know, today is the last Sunday when we officially have to wear face masks. But spiritually, we need to remove these masks as well and be honest with one another, be real with each other and with God. You know, so often somebody will say, how are you? And we say, oh, we're fine. But we're not really. We're hiding so much. You know, we are family. We love and we care for each one of, uh, each one of here. You know, and, and we're a worldwide family as well, which is why our hearts go out for our fellow brothers and sisters around the world facing to, um, torments and war and persecution and so on but this morning we're in a place with God in the atmosphere in the presence of his Holy Spirit and Jason prayed about healing this morning already but you can be healed through this communion table you know Jesus said by my stripes you were healed this morning, as you take communion, if you're standing in need of any healing, be it physical, be it emotional, be it mental or spiritual, claim healing in the name of Jesus as you take communion this morning. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he also took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Praise him. We're just going to have the children come and join us for a moment. I'm afraid they've all kind of jumped the gun. They're so enthusiastic to get into Sunday school. They've gone already. But we're just going to ask the children to come back in for a moment. One of these days they'll come marching in here singing songs. One of these days they'll come in here marching, singing songs with the anointing of the Lord pouring out over them. Morning, guys. You okay? Is God good? Yeah. Always the Pennington's last, I don't know. <laughs> Come on, dude. So let's just raise our hands. We want to bless. A church that blesses is a church that knows blessing. And so this morning, Father, we pray you would bless these young ones as they go to class, as they learn more about you. We pray that you'd pour out your goodness, your mercy, and your love on them, not just today, but every day. For the rest of their lives, may they continue to know the everlasting abundance of God's blessing and peace upon their lives. The Lord bless you this morning. Have a great class. Okay, thank you guys. That's great. One of these days, it's going to take us half an hour just to get all the children in. Don't laugh, that's faith. If I can't show you how to walk in faith, how are you ever going to know? You're going to just keep telling me your statements of unbelief. At some point, you've got to start listening to my statements of belief. I know who I have believed, and I'm persuaded. I am not stopping believing in the moving of God. Even in these coming weeks, God has been moving recently in the past weeks. God is moving in the coming weeks. I, I tell you, there's nothing can stop God's moving because God is on the move. We see things. We see things as God begins to break through, and it's just awesome. But this morning, I just have a thought for you as we continue on this idea. We're following a, a theme, but I'm, I'm just breaking out into some um, different avenues of this theme of being transformed. And so this morning, I, I find myself, I had one verse, but I, I just feel really compelled to change it to another. And it's this, Romans 8 and chapter 15. It's as simple as this. Okay, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received a spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba Father. You know, I was reading something, and uh, just interesting in my daily readings, I was reading something, and he said this, that um, we're not just waiting to be with Christ, seated with Christ in heavenly places, but because of the way that resurrection power, because of the way that this thing we call redemption, God's salvation, because of the way that works, God sees us as there now. Well, that's good, isn't it? Some of you are looking at me a bit blank. Because I accept Jesus and what he's done, it's as if I am sitting with him on the throne of grace next to the Father at his right hand, now. That's how God sees me. And that's how God sees you. You are right there with him. And you turn around and say, well, my legs ache. When I'm queuing for petrol and there's like a 20 mile queue because there's problems at the supermarket at one end of town and the other end of town, they all rushed in to get cheap fuel because they thought, you know, a few pounds is going to change my life. Fear. Yeah. Some of you look like you don't know that there's been panic buying at the petrol pumps in one of our local supermarkets because the other supermarket, their fuel pumps broke. It's just a simple thing. But everybody 
is rushing to get fuel because they want to save themselves a few pounds. As if a few pounds will make a difference to the world. Uh, you know, this morning, if you're desperate for a few pounds to change your life, I pray for you. Because if things are that bad that a few pounds is going to make a difference, then come along and connect with our hope programs and we'll, we'll give you some food and we'll give you some clothes and we'll help you. Because if a few pounds is the difference between being happy and not being happy, then oh, may the Lord show you his light. But I see this scripture this morning. I see this idea that I see people who get into bondage all the time over different things. This morning, our focus is on the idea of fear. Fear has a terrible, terrible effect on life. But I see this idea that we get into bondage over so many things. Where do we get into bondage? Is it chains? I don't think so. I, I look at the, the history of, of certain people groups around the world. I look at Christians in the early days of Rome being persecuted and they were put in chains. They were freer than the men walking around with swords on their hips. They were free. Because their freedom didn't depend on what was around their hands and their feet. Their freedom depended on what was in their hearts and their minds. They'd been set free from bondage. Because if you believe you're a captive, you'll always be a captive. Unless the sun comes and makes you free. Because as we said before, whom the sun sets free, come on this morning, you know it's true. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. But it's no good just quoting the scripture like a mantra. Like, oh, I've got a plaster with Captain America on which is going to make my cuts heal quicker. No, what you need this morning is you need to adjust your thinking so that you're not just telling yourself the scripture, but you are living the reality of the scripture that you are free because he set you free and now you know freedom. Them. Otherwise, you're just quoting verses. And the devil's really good at that. He quoted verses at Jesus. Jesus just laughed at him and quoted them back. And the ones Jesus quoted had more application. Because to Jesus, they were truth. To the devil, they were just tools to try and ensnare people. Our thinking is a, a real, real issue. And in a very comfortable and affluent society, poverty is nominal compared to some parts of the world. Um, when we had the privilege of visiting um, North Ukraine, I tell you, I saw poverty in Europe. People living in tin shacks in Europe. It's hard to imagine. It's just roads that were, you, you know, they looked like they'd had a war before the war because the roads were in such a bad condition. Uh, and, you know, we, we get so caught up in this mindset, in this nation of ours that, oh, I'm poor because I don't have this and I can't do that and I can't go the other. But actually, I'm warm, I'm safe, and I'm fed. That's good. That's a blessing. That really is. And there are some people, because of various issues, sometimes mental health issues, sometimes substance abuse, sometimes because of conflict at home, who get caught out of the system. And thank God that not only our team, but other teams are there to help people because there's no reason in the 21st century in the UK where anybody should be trapped in bondage. There isn't. And so I see this idea of the... God hasn't given us a spirit of bondage again to fear. In other words, what he's saying is this. You know, I haven't called you to salvation to be a slave of a, under oppression. But I've called you to salvation so that you might be a slave of choice. Paul says, a bond servant. You know, in the King James Version, um, when King James signed off on the publication of the English translation of the Bible, what, what is now called the authorized version, um, when he signed off on that, he didn't want the word slave to be written into the text because he said, British people can't be slaves. We sing great hymns about it, don't we, sometimes? You can't be a slave if you're British. Unthinkable. But Paul, when he wrote, said, I've chosen a better master. I have surrendered to a more higher authority. 
than the one who held my life in bondage. So though I submit myself to Christ, I'm not in bondage to him. I give myself to him freely. But here's what this text is telling me this morning. As I give myself freely to Christ, I find out that I'm not becoming a servant of Christ, but a son of Christ. That I'm not there as a servant only, but in fact, I am an heir of the house. And if I'm an heir of the house, then I'm an heir of all the promises and all the authority and all the power and all the glory and all the presence of the whole kingdom of heaven. And we know that the kingdom of heaven far exceeds the kingdoms of this earth. And so I realize that along with Christ, I am a fellow heir not only of the grace of God through the thing that he has done for me through Jesus, but also with him I have this wonderful experience that as his son, as his heir, I have the authority of the kingdom too. Why? Because I chose to give my life to him and I find that in giving my life to him in surrender, I am not treated as a slave, but I am treated as the heir of the house. Does that make sense this morning? Whereas when I get into thinking that somehow this isn't going to work or that isn't going to work or this is going to be a problem or that is going to be a problem, if I'm going to worry about my health or my wealth or you name it, you know, when you've got nothing to worry about, if, if you were given to worrying, if you were caught in that bondage, even when you've got nothing to worry about, you'll worry about whether the wallpaper is going to peel around the window. You'll find something because that's the nature of the bondage of fear. Even when you've got nothing to be afraid of, you'll find something to be afraid of. Even though you've got nothing to worry about, you'll find something to worry about. It is the nature of that kind of captivity. And what we must do as children of Christ is realize that that possessive, controlling experience of mind and heart, this bondage that the Bible speaks of is no longer ours. It does not apply because Jesus Christ has come. He has died and he has risen again. And as he rose, those chains of bondage were broken. The difficulty is not whether Christ has broken the chains, but whether we have chosen to throw them off or not now that the shackles are gone. We used to sing it all the time. I remember being a youngster and being dragged along to church, and it was back then. It was being dragged along to church when you were a youngster because you had to go whether you wanted to or not. I remember being dragged along to church, and we'd sing this, this song, My Shackles Are Gone. My spirit is free. And oh boy, the joy in that house. And, and you'd listen to people singing, and you watch around, and most of the people, you know, they knew it. It wasn't just words they were singing. It was the experience of their lives because they had got to the point where they realized, God, I can't live in this bondage any longer. I can't live in fear and worry and just this extreme expectation of the very worst, which is what worry is. Worry is an untruth. It is believing a lie that the worst might happen. Go and speak to somebody who has experienced the very worst things that can happen in life and they will tell you the moment it happens, and they were calm. But before it happened, all the panic in the world. It's crazy, isn't it? And I, and I think that there's this, there's this terrible, twisted way in which the enemy comes and afflicts the human brain and the human thought processes with this this way of thinking that just makes us so negative. It's like everything's always going to be bad. And let's be honest, as a nation, as a nation, we, we talk about, you know, the stiff upper lip. We've only got a stiff upper lip because we expect things to be bad. We can be a very pessimistic society, can't we? And, and that doesn't, it doesn't go any easier when we read the news because the press love to tell us all the doom and gloom. Think sad things, think bad things, think rebellious things, think discouraging things. It's what sells newspapers, which tells you about the nature of society. Because if we didn't like to dwell on that stuff, newspapers would have to sell us good news stories because we'd be a very different society. Does that make it truth for you so you can see the reality? So it's this challenge then, isn't it? 
Because Jesus said, don't be conformed to this world. But be transformed. Change your thinking. Change that thinking from being captive to fear and worry and doubt and anxiety. And be set free into the freedom of I am a child of God. I, I look at this whole thing and I think, well, you know, one of the greatest challenges to Christians, one of the greatest challenges is fear. We see it in so many ways, in so many expressions, fear. And yet Jesus said, don't be afraid of the world. In fact, he said, be of good cheer. Put it in the Pastor Jason paraphrase version. Oh, cheer up, you miserable face. <laughs> Jesus is one. That's what Jesus was saying. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. If the sun has overcome the world, then the heirs that stand with the sun are also overcomers of the world. One of our challenges is learning how to overcome the world. But the first step is recognizing that I need to. Life isn't something, you know, I, I don't live life like I'm on a boat without oars. I, I don't live life like I'm on a bus without a driver. I don't live life like it's just something that happens and I'm the victim of my life. You see the captivity thinking? I'm the victim of my life because what's happening is life happens to me. But the heirs, life doesn't happen to them. They affect life. Oh, that doesn't look too well. The heirs are the people, let's see it again, who affect life. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world. Not go into all the world and share fear and worry. Go into the world and share this good news. You're free. You've been made free. You know the authority of the kingdom. You know the power and the rights of the children of God. Everywhere you walk, the, the, even the earth underneath, you better start moving because you don't just change the environment. You change everything. If you were a child of God, where you go, God goes. Where God goes, everything changes. Because where God is, the kingdom is. Or am I speaking in tongues this morning? I'm a child of God. What does that mean? What does that mean? I'm a child of God. The Bible says all the promises in Him are yes and amen. What promises? What promises? Well, have you read your Bible? In the early church, they couldn't get enough of this thing. I mean, I know we, we've got these fluorescent gods in the corner of our houses that take all our time and stop us from diving into the deep pools of God's wealth and resource. It's called the Bible. You can check it out. If you need it on a digital form because you're still captive to the idea of electronic gadgets like me, <laughs> then you can get the Bible in a digital form as well. Isn't that good? If you can't see it too well, the Bible will speak to you. What a wonderful generation we live in. You can press play and the Bible will speak to you. There's no excuse. What are the promises of God? I will never leave you. God, I'm afraid I'm on my own. Get rid of that fear. I'm with you. God, I'm worried this will happen. Neither height nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. You see how this works? So often we get caught in bondage because we don't apply the authority of the word we've been given. And so we stay in those positions of captivity. It's like Jesus comes along. You think of, you know, Paul um, in, in Philippi. And there's an earthquake because they're praising. I tell you where the Christians, are, the believers are praying and praising. Earthquakes happen. For the right reasons. And the prison doors are thrown open. And the jailer's about to kill himself. And here's Paul still in his prison cell. 
Now, Paul's in his prison cell not for the sake of Paul, but for the sake of the jailer. It's a different text. Let's not take it out of context. But for you and I, so often the earthquake happens, Jesus comes into our lives, and we, st- well, actually, we just put a bunch of flowers on the windowsill in the cell. I'm a Christian now. I can have some flowers on the window. But we still live in captivity. We still keep the same patterns of thinking and then wonder why we get the same results throughout our lives and why we live such desperate situations over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's like a record that's broken. Remember though, I, I'm talking to the wrong generation sometimes, I think. You remember vinyl records? You play it that much, you get a big groove in the middle of it and it wasn't the one for the music. Just in your favorite bit, all of a sudden it's like, and ah, <laughs> Yeah, but that's our minds, isn't it? Because because Jesus comes and he changes the record. But we still like our favorite tunes. We're talking about this on Wednesday. We're talking about the biology of this, neuroscience. This isn't just a habitual thing. There is biology to this. Because the patterns we think in become the... I'm not even going to go there this morning. Watch Wednesday's Bible study. You'll get it. But it's this idea that our brains become set in patterns of thinking. And so what happens is, if we don't make the effort to change our thinking, we will always keep being the same person. But if anyone is in Christ Jesus, they are a, the same person they were yesterday, of course. It's not what I read in my Bible. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, they are a new person creation. And so what I see as I accept Jesus, as I walk in this redemption, this love, this salvation, this experience of God's life in me, I see the Holy Spirit working not just in my spirit, but if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will also with him Raise your mortal bodies. In other words, there is a renewing process taking place in your physical body, not just in your spiritual man. That is scripture. And we don't dwell on those things, do we? And yet there it is, black and white, in the word for you to read that your physical body is being affected by the Spirit of God. And where does God most want to affect? Does he want to give you fabulous knees so you can run a marathon at 90? No, not unless God's got a purpose in it. Does God give you brilliant eyesight at 87 so you can read the numbers on the back of a bus at a thousand yards away? No, though he might if it's got a purpose to him. But what God definitely does is he comes and rewires our thinking. He retunes our brains. So our brains become tuned to kingdom thinking not earthly thinking. Earthly thinking is, what if, what about, what when, what am I going to do? Oh my, worry, worry, worry. Heavenly thinking is, it is well. It is well with my soul. That Christ, well, I don't like singing hymns, but that Christ has regarded my helpless estate. In other words, he's looked at how incapable I am of affecting change in my thinking and shed his blood, given his life, sent his spirit to work on this so I can change the way I think so that I become a different person, a person who is no longer a captive to bondage and fear, but is a person who is an heir of God, a recipient of his grace, and looking forward to the rewards of eternity in a kingdom that will have no end. And suddenly I realize I really need to let God do some work in my thought processes. Because when God transforms this, Everything changes. It's why people have stood in front of executioners throughout the centuries and not flinched. Because their confidence was in someone greater and their promise was in something higher and therefore they were able to look to a better day considering this world not worthy of them because the one that they were attaining was a world without end. 
the eternal kingdom of the heavenly realm. And, and I think it's about time we talk like that again, isn't it? That we stop just pampering to the needs of the moment. Supermarket church. Do you know what I mean by supermarket church? You come on a Sunday, we, we rub some ointment on, they're there, it's been a hard week. And then we sugarcoat some medicine, they're there, there's a good message to make you feel good. And we pamper you in so many ways and yet you go home and you're still a casualty of bondage. But when you're free, when you're free, you become a minister of grace. When you're free, you're a minister of God's goodness in your life. And there are lots of things we can talk about being free from this morning. Free from the failure of falling into temptation. But that's a different subject. We'll look at that again. But this morning we're talking about fear. We're talking about this idea of the anxieties and the concerns that overwhelm us. Why am I talking about this this morning? You know, I was raised, like many of you, in a generation where I was told, believe it or not, in the classroom, I was told, if the siren goes off, get under the desk. There was no nuclear war. There were no bombs. But in school, we would have regular drills where we were told to get under the desk, cover our heads, and wait for the explosion. Because we lived under the constant shadow of nuclear war, and everybody was told in the event of a nuclear war, I can still see the images burnt in my eyes. You know, in the event that the siren goes off, be ready. You know, put tape on your windows, throw water on your curtains and close them. If you haven't got a cellar or a basement, get under the kitchen table. Like a kitchen table is going to stop a one megaton bomb, let alone all the ones that go now. But there, there it goes. You know, you'll be safe. Hide under the table. Apparently, tables are bombproof. See how irrational fear can be? And how irrational life can be? The only thing that is beyond a doubt, truth, certain, dependable, and brings me hope is this. If I lose my life on this earth, I have a far better one waiting where there is neither sorrow, nor sickness, nor dying, nor grief, nor trouble, nor heartache, but nothing, and I mean but nothing other than joy, inexpressible, and full of glory because I see Jesus, the hope and the light of my salvation, I realize that fear should not have a place in my thinking, but only the hope and the joy for which I've been laid hold of. And that is this, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. And as I, I was thinking, it's only this last week as all this trouble came in Ukraine, I, I thought about, well, I'd finally... When the Berlin Wall came down, I'd finally started to realize we weren't living in the shadow of fear anymore as a nation. And then in one week, suddenly I could see fear slipping back into our nation. Oh my. And then, and then I, was, I was looking at the news and some bright spark, honestly, the man should be fired for fear mongering. Might have been a woman actually. But somebody on the news put this. This is all Russia have to do to kill millions of people in the southeast of the UK. I'm thinking, oh, thanks very much. I was, just, I was just getting a bit settled in this. Because of the fear that grips our society and the fear that grips our world. And I look at all that. I don't know I'm a little, a little bit tongue-in-cheek about it all, but the truth is this. It's very real to many people. But if you're caught in fear, Oh, I'm, I'm going on this morning. I'm, I've been way too long. But here's the thing. You know, you go out into the wilds and you meet a wild predator. And they always say, the hunters will always say, don't be afraid. Look them straight in the eyes. Stand them down. Because they can smell fear. Yeah, well, the world can smell fear too. And you go telling people there's hope in Jesus Christ and they smell fear. It's like, well, you know, I hear what you're saying, but the fragrance says something different. I hear what you're saying, but your body language. I hear what you're saying, but the way you act tells me you're full of fear. It tells me you have anxieties and concerns and that this hope that you profess isn't a hope at all. And that's a challenge, isn't it? Because the world isn't going to come to you for answers when they see that you're suffering the same malady that they're suffering. 
But if I've Jesus, really got Jesus, and Jesus has really got me, then what I have is this issue that wipes out fear. I wanted to get to this. I really did. I have this thing that wipes out fear. It's a superpower. This is the bit where I rip my shirt off and I get a big t-shirt underneath. <laughs> Not. <laughs> but, but let me tell you what the superpower of every believer is. Let me tell you what the superpower is. You know you got a superpower this morning? You know you got a superpower this morning? Do you know you were a superhero this morning? Never think of yourselves like that, do you? I might preach this next week, God willing. Do you know you're a superhero? Let me tell you why you're a superhero. Because God has put his love in you. And perfect love casts out fear. And here's the issue. I want to finish with this. Time's gone, but I've really got to get this statement in. If you are not a captive to fear, then you are living in hope. But you can't be living in hope if you are living in fear. The two are mutually exclusive. So I need God's love to come and work in my life so I feel so safe in Him that His love assures me of all things. You know when we have the presence of God falling in the room in wonderful ways in those worship meetings and those special gatherings or when we have those special charismatic Pentecostal evangelists that we bring from time to time and the sense of God's presence is so wonderful you feel like you're eating ice cream on a hot sunny day on a beautiful beach. You know that it is well with my soul feeling. But God says that's the place I want you to live all the time. It's not a good time thing. It's a God time thing. It's an all time thing. It's love. It is love. It is God's love for us that gives us the assurance that we have peace even in the middle of conflict, that we have hope even in the middle of uncertainty, that it is well. No matter how bad life gets, God's got this. And then when we're living in that love, here's the, here's the final thought this morning is when we're living in that love, we become ministers of that love. Not ministers in a pulpit with a collar, doing all the formal stuff. We are ministers of the best bit, the love bit. Because we just simply walk through life showing others the love that we have ourselves experienced. Until people come into church and they're blown away not just because we're good with each other but because the love is overwhelming and that kind of love changes communities not just individuals that kind of love casts out all fear and so this morning I just want to encourage you it's not about being in bondage Jesus dealt with that and it's up to us to actually walk out of bondage and into freedom yeah, God breaks the chains, but we have to do our part and leave the bondage behind, change our thinking. But once we've left the bondage, we must protect ourselves from being caught back into it by living in the love. And the more we live in the love, the more we will impact the lives of others and the more people will want to know this hope that we have. Nobody wants to hear our words. They want to see somebody who's got hope. They want to see somebody who loves no matter what. That's tough. We'll talk about that another time. This morning, that's all we've got time for. I just encourage you, if you're caught in fears and anxieties and worries, if there are things, hang-ups from your past, your present, or worries about the future, lay them at the cross. Let go and let God. Stop worrying let God have his perfect way in your life. Come and find out the love that God really has for you and how much of a difference that love makes right in here because it's a peacemaking love. It is an assuring love. It is a life-transforming love. And I just encourage you as we finish online this morning that if you reach out to him, he will come right into your room right now.
administer his healing grace and peace, release you from those chains, and let you know the love. In Jesus' name, we'll see you soon. Right now, I just... I